the US economy, and in particular the stock market, have uh, had quite a run. The reality is that uh, in, in uh, it, you know, when the, when the market and when the economy collapsed in 2008, that is uh, 15 years ago, it really did look like we were in for a long period of stagnation, of lack of economic growth, of declining standard of living and quality of life, and, and potentially even, and, and of course, of, of a stock market that challenged or, or, or was challenged to, uh, uh, to recover. And yet what actually happened uh, was that the United States economy did, it did do well, but it did okay. The stock market did phenomenally well. And, uh, and, and it, you know, this is a, a large extent the consequence of uh, what, many, what, what many would argue is massive injections of uh, money into the economy through QE or liquidity into the economy. It's not clear there was money really, but liquidity into the economy uh, uh, during QE. And at the time, what I said the consequence would be would be stagnation. And, 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 and that's indeed what we had. We had very low economic growth. Even during uh, the Trump years, the economy grew at 2%. Uh, it was unimpressive, to say the least. What we also experienced was something completely unprecedented in really, in, in certainly in modern history, but maybe in all of human history. And that is we experienced for a long period of time of a negative to zero in, uh, uh, interest rates. That is, uh, the cost of borrowing was sometimes negative. You were being paid to borrow money. Certainly in Europe, for long periods of time, on certain government bonds, interest rates were negative. In Switzerland, in, in, uh, in Denmark, in other countries, uh, you had negative interest rates. Really unprecedented in human history. And it goes against, flies counter to all of financial and economic theory that such a thing would exist. So you had money being uh, created and, uh, and, and uh, you know, flooded the economy. You had interest rates at a zero or sometimes even negative. And in the United States, you had interest rates of basically zero, maybe 1%, maybe 2%, but, but nothing above that. And then, of course, COVID happened. So on top of these very, very low interest rates, which were already trying, starting to create real distortions and perversions in the economy, and, and where there was already angst about how long this could survive, we then got a, a you know, a, a COVID boost to government spending, a massive stimulus, uh, you know, really unprecedented in size, both under Bush, Bush, where did Bush come from? Both under Trump and then under, Ob uh, under Biden, we got two massive stimulus packages. Uh, and the result was what you would expect. That is uh, the result of helicopter money, the result of just sending people checks in the mail, the result of just flooding the market with money directly to uh, consumers has been inflation. And with inflation, interest rates have risen. And in spite of the fact that everybody thought inflation would peak, inflation does not seem to have peaked. It seems to have stabilized. It seems to be going sideways uh, for now. And on top of that, interest rates are high, and they seem to be, this seems to be a, an acknowledgement, at least among many, that interest rates are going to stay high. Now, interest rates right now, uh, the 10-year the, uh, the bond uh, yesterday peaked at 4.5-something. I mean, it's kind of funny, sad, funny, to think that people think that this is a, um, that this is somehow high interest rates. In 1981, I think it was, the 10-year bond was, uh, 40, uh, sorry, in, 19, in the early 1990s or the late 80s, the 10-year the bond was in, was in the mid-teens. Uh, indeed, uh, for 40 years from the end of World War II, basically, until the early uh, 1980s, interest rates only went up. And then in the 1970s, they spiked up with inflation and they continued to do so in the 80s. And only, only from 82 have we had a period of 40 years, as it turns out, 
cycles of 40 years, something. Um, uh, another 40 years where interest rates have only gone down. So uh, they've gone down so much to zero, negative, that suddenly an interest rate of 4.5% seems high. I mean, 4.5% is not high. But if you build into your assumptions, if you build into your plans, if you build into your cash flow estimates, if you build into the affordability of housing, the affordability of building plants, of buying equipment, of doing business, an interest rate that is zero, then 4.5% suddenly is really, really high. So we are in a situation right now where a lot of people who thought interest rates would be zero or close to zero forever are suddenly encountering high interest rates. Uh, we have uh, companies all over the place that are going to have to refinance their debt instead of at 3 4 5%. They're going to have to refinance the debt at 7 8 9%. Where people would like to buy homes but are used to mortgages of 2 3 4 5% and now looking at mortgages of 7 8 9%. People don't want to sell their homes because they don't want to have to go and buy. They, they're sitting on 3% mortgages. They don't want to give that up. That's cheap money. They don't want to give that up. I don't want to sell my home because the mortgage is too valuable. The U.S. government raised money at zero to 2% interest rates for years, all short-term money now is facing a situation where those interest rates are 4 or 5%. And the U.S. government is running massive deficits. And all of this has to ultimately be reflected in less economic activity, in a real slowdown of growth, and in substantial bankruptcies, and in companies going bust. Add to that the fact that the U.S. government is running deficits higher than it ever has, higher than during, uh, as high as it's been uh, during the wars. It is a, uh, it is running deficits, it is running debt at the highest levels ever. Deficits continue forever, so there's no prospects, no prospects of those deficits shrinking Nobody can. Nobody has any plan to uh, to bring about the shrinkage of those deficits. You've got Social Security, Medicare out of control. It's just hard to paint a picture of a positive economic outcome. On top of that, China, our number one or number two trading partner trade is win-win, is going through a massive economic restructuring. Its real estate sec sector is crashing, collapsing, going bankrupt. But so are many of its other businesses. Much of the Chinese economy has been propped up with, by the real estate sector, the artificiality of that real estate sector. And it really does look like the, uh, the Chinese economy is going to slow, maybe even start shrinking. We know about the demographic collapse in China, and, and that is not completely sunk in yet into the Chinese psyche or into the rest of the world psyche. But it is happening. It's happening faster than anybody expected. So you've got an economic collapse happening in China, just as China is, of course, moving in the wrong direction. Instead of freeing up its economy, there's a funny quote uh, of the of the uh, Chinese premier of Xi the other day. He he was on a tour somewhere, and he was he was kind of demanding. He was demanding more innovation. He was demanding more e technological progress. He was demanding. A, I mean, there are ways to get more innovation, more economic progress, but the ways to do that are through liberty and freedom and free markets and. 
not by penalizing your top entrepreneurs, not by making them disappear, not by putting them in jail or house arrest or wherever they put them, not by breaking them up. So uh, China's in decline. And let's be clear, I know many of you might be celebrating the decline of China, and there's an uh, a element of, of good that comes from China declining. But there's also a lot of bad. Chinese economic activity was a real driver of economic growth in the United States. It was a real driver of rising standard of livings in the United States. Counter to the story about job losses to China, jobs were not lost to China. Jobs were gained because of China, because of trade with China. And quality of life, standard of living actually increased because of trade with China. So to see China decline economically is another force, another negative force driving economic growth in the United States downward, putting pressure on the, United, on the U.S. economy. So China's in real trouble with no path out, just like the United States has no path out. Nobody, nobody. Literally nobody has a plan for how to deal with the challenges that the U.S. economy faces today. Europe is in recession. Certainly Germany is in recession. Parts of other Europe is, are in recession. And, you know, the, 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 the prospects for European manufacturing, uh, Germany bucked the trend for a long time of being a manufacturing powerhouse and exporting in spite of high labor costs, exporting out of Germany, to a large extent exporting to China. Well, with China's decline, German exports are down. Germany's also losing its manufacturing edge. Automobiles, for example, coming out of Germany are not the right politically correct automobiles and are electric. The electric car industry is dominated, at least for now, by Tesla and by the Chinese. Germany seems to be in decline. The rest of Europe is in trouble as it tries to fund the Ukrainian war, tries to keep their own economies going, try to go green or carbon neutral at the same time, and somehow produce electricity for uh, the coming winter. As gas prices or, or oil prices are now approaching $100 a barrel, which will raise the cost of energy significantly all over the world. So real dramatic headwinds, real dramatic clouds. Look at the UK, where inflation is persistent, interest rates are high, the economy probably shrinking. And at the same time, at the same time, every single part of the world, there is not a single part of the world where you can say economies are thriving over there. I mean, South America, Latin America struggling in spite of the fact that they are uh, mineral rich economies. They're struggling. They're struggling primarily because they're dominated by socialist and fascist economies. Africa is struggling. It's always struggled. It continues to struggle. You know, maybe India is doing a little bit better, but India has all kinds of other problems that constrain its ability to grow economically and to replace China as a motor of economic growth. Mexico is doing okay, but again, struggling under a socialist president and, and probably another socialist president next year when elections are held. Canada struggling in spite of the fact that it has massive quantities of natural resources. The world economies, there's not a single region in the world right now that you can say is healthy, is growth oriented, and has the potential to really help avert a true economic slowdown. 
we've got the United States is um, is not only in the process of of spending, uh, you know, and deficits and all of that, but there's very little energy around getting rid of regulations, getting rid of constraints on business to expand. Quite the contrary. There is bipartisan efforts to go after American big business, primarily to go after the key drivers, at least of the stock market um, performance of the last 15 years, and that's big tech. I mean, what has allowed the U.S. economy to be successful over the last 20 years? What has allowed the U.S. economy to lead the world? And, and, and what, is, what has made the U.S. economy so resilient to economic forces? It's the tech industry. And who are the most successful of the companies in the tech industry that employ more people, that, that pay higher wages? It's big tech. And what is our politicians' response to that? Is it to encourage more? Is it to congratulate them? Is it to thank them? Is it to promote more great tech companies in the United States? Not that politicians need to do that. But no. Is it to cut their taxes? Is it to reduce the regulations they face? Reduce the trade barriers they face overseas? No. It's to drag them into court to fight antitrust lawsuits. So we're taking the most successful companies in America, the ones that are responsible for much of the economic growth over the last 20 years, and we're going to penalize them. We're going to try to destroy them. We're going to try to break them up. All in the name of consumer well-being, a consumer will be a lot better off with our big tech, with our big companies employing, producing, creating, building, delivering. So if you add the fiscal irresponsibility of the U.S. government to the regulatory irresponsibility of the U.S. government to this antitrust environment which is trying to break up our best and most productive companies, to the fact that productivity growth is down, to the fact that in spite of the fact that we have maybe the record numbers of people crossing the border into the United States, we have less immigration than ever of people to come and work in the United States. People crossing the border right now, the United States are not allowed to work. We ban them from the workforce. We give them welfare. We ban them from work. Crazy policy. Insane. Yes, let's import more welfare recipients. Let's increase the welfare rolls. So you've got an a, a, a economic environment where basically all the forces are aligned against growth, against prosperity, against success. Where uh, it, it's, it's likely that we see more bankruptcies, more failures. It's hard to see what, where, the, where, where the saving, you know, what industry is going to save us, where the economic growth is going to come from, uh, you know, who's going to pay down their debts. Uh, one scenario, I guess the scenario the market likes the best, actually, yeah, the, the scenario the market likes the best right now is a recession, a quick recession, a recession that's so bad that the Fed, the Federal Reserve panics and reduces interest rates back to zero again in order to get us out of that recession. So the solution to our economic malay is not, is not economic growth. It's not production. It's not building. It's financial jiggering with low interest rates they can only come about because of an actual economic slide, recession, and somehow markets think this is a good thing. No, it's terrible. And a recession is going to be hard to come out of. There's no easy way out of it. There's no, I mean, yes, the Fed will, 
pour money back into the economy. But the Fed will be cautious because of inflation. And the federal government will have a problem spending itself out of this because it has to be cautious because of inflation, but also because of the massive deficits and who's going to buy that debt. So while I still think the U.S. is probably positioned best in the world economically to, to survive the storm that is coming, nobody is going to be completely spared from the storm. Nobody is going to be spared. The coming storm is, could be really devastating, really challenging. Some, a kind of a session that we haven't seen in a long time. And a recession that hits Main Street in ways that I think the latest last few recessions have hit sectors of the economy that haven't affected Main Street that much. The dot com bubble bursting was mainly a Silicon Valley recession. The, the, the 2008 was to a large extent a banking and and uh, and um, Wall Street recession. But we could see a, a a lot worse than that affecting a lot more people. And all of this at the time, not only of antitrust laws, of, of, of regulations not shrinking, but also of labor unrest. I mean, the auto workers are asking for a 40 plus percent raise. They're asking for defined benefits pensions going backwards. They're asking to raise the costs of producing automobiles in the United States with labor union, with labor wages, an absurd amount. They're asking to make Detroit a lot less competitive, a lot less competitive than they have been, 32-hour work weeks. They're asking basically for Ford and Chrysler and GM to acquiesce to their own destruction. And what options do other companies have? They could fire all the workers, but that would be illegal. That would be impossible to do. I mean, the president of the United States was on the picket lines. So, uh, you know, ultimately that comes to some compromise, I assume. The compromise will still raise dramatically the cost of making a car. You know who has the cheapest cost of building a car in the United States? Who has the cheapest cost of labor in the U.S.? It's not Detroit. It's Tesla. And after Tesla, it's Nissan and Toyota and BMW and Mercedes in the South. It's ununionized labor. The highest cost of building a car in the United States is Detroit. And now they want to make it more expensive? And how is that going to work exactly? How is that going to work? And how are they going to compete? So add, add dramatically to our lack of productivity. And it's stunning because there's so many things that could be done. There's so many ways to fix it. And the solution that Biden, the Democrats, many Republicans, and many economists seem to adhere to right now is more central planning, more industrial planning, more government-subsidized electric cars and batteries and government-subsidized solar panels and government-subsidized chip manufacturers and government-subsidized everything. Now, where exactly in the world has that worked? So, again, I think we're heading towards dark economic times. I just don't see any upside. Now, whether it happens with one big drop, one big decline, whether it happens through slow stagnation for many decades, I don't know. I don't know. How it plays out, I don't know. 
And the reality is that it's going to be global because the world is very interconnected. The, the failure of the economies of China and Europe are affecting the U.S. The slowdown in the U.S. will affect China and Europe. And I know people have been talking about recession for a long time now, but it really does seem like just as people are coming to the conclusion there won't be a recession, that's probably the best time to be thinking there will be one. But it does really look like starting next year, we're going to be facing a, a, a real potential for a recession. A reality, not just a potential, a reality of a recession. It's an election year, and yet I'm not sure anybody can do anything about it. 